Meet a narrow-minded con artist, a man who prefers cheap hotels and cheaper hats. He's got big talent, but small dreams, who spends too much time burying his head in print. It's a story about someone who pinned their future in the obituaries and regretted it. This was an episode written by Rod Serling and directed by John Brom. As always, the alternative theories mentioned within may cause anxiety, rage, and disbelief. But that's why you're here, I hope. Kindly consider leaving a like, share, or subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Now, we don't have much time. The four of us are dying. Arch Hammer is another in a long line of Twilight Zone's 36-year-old men who have trouble finding their place in life. Rod Serling described him best as he's been a salesman, a dispatcher, a truck driver, a con man, a bookie, and a part-time bartender. This is a cheap man, a nickel and dime man, with a cheapness that goes past the suit and the shirt. This much he does have. He can make his face change. He can twitch a muscle, move a jaw, and he can change his face. Hammer is a man with big talent but small dreams. His inspiration for respect comes from the obituary section of the city newspaper. His first score is taking the face of one Johnny Foster, a recently deceased trumpeteer. Hammer strolls into Foster's old hangout with a new face and begins making moves on Foster's grieving girlfriend, Maggie. Hammer persuades Maggie to run off with him on a midnight train to Chicago. Why shouldn't he have the luck like that when he can just steal it? Next is taking up the shoes of a murdered gangster, Virgil Sterig. He easily finds the home of mob boss, Mr. Pennell, and extorts Virgil's cut of the money owed to him. However, Hammer decides to take it all. Alone, Mr. Pennell is another beer drinker with a beer belly. But with his thugs, Pennell is dangerous when in a bad mood. Hammer, in Virgil's face, races out into the streets and is cornered in a dead end. With Mr. Pennell's goons closing in, Hammer thinks hard for a new face. He takes the one from a poster smeared on the wall, a broken-nosed brawler named Andy Marshak. The Hammer Marshak face fools Pennell's men and Hammer walks out from the alley unscathed. However, Hammer's luck with Marshak's face takes an unfortunate, near-impossible crazy turn as he catches the attention of an elderly late-night newspaper vendor right around the corner. The stunned-looking old man takes Hammer as his estranged and no-good son, Andy. The old man has nothing but a hate-hate relationship with Andy and despises the image of him, more when Hammer says he doesn't recognize the old man, as if things said between them couldn't be worse. Hammer pushes the belligerent man to the pavement. Happy Father's Day. Back in his hotel room, he finds no refuge, as a police detective wants to take him back to the station for a bunco wrap in Detroit. However, using a revolving door... Hammer confuses and loses his police escort by going back to his Marshak face. Celebrating with a smoke, he's free to get away and hook up with Maggie, until the old man appears in front of him. Fresh on his feet, the old man had tracked his son, bringing a loaded gun and that wild-eyed look on his face. Hammer reassures the old man he got it all wrong. He only asked for time so he can show him a different face. Well, Hammer takes up too much time being nervous, and the old man kills him. Hammer drops to the sidewalk like a stack of newspapers. His face changes to Foster, Steerig, Marshak, and Hammer, showing his true supernatural abilities for one last time. The old man witnesses it all and how he made four die. He shows no remorse. When first watching The Four of Us Are Dying, I was worried it would be little more than a gimmick episode. However, there are a couple themes and room for alternative theories. The first theme is one of want, or the misery of desire. Hammer is described in Serling's monologue as pretty much a miserable person, just from the colorful descriptions of him. It's the people around him, with whom he interacts, who are in misery too. The first is Maggie, who makes it known early she wants a drink and to enjoy it alone. When Hammer arrives, 
impersonating Johnny Foster, Maggie buys into the fantasy and wants to be with him on that late night train to Chicago. Mr. Pennell, also named many times in the episode as Mr. Pennell, wants to keep all the blood money for himself. Then there's old man Marshak. He had a simple wish to see his son dead. Here is where everyone loses. Maggie will never see her Johnny at the train station after quitting her job. Mr. Pennell won't see his money as it is likely confiscated by the local police. Old man Marshak didn't shoot his son. He killed a stranger. He may be headed to an asylum at that. Even the detective lost out on bringing in his suspect for questioning as Hammer was innocent until proven guilty. Hammer losing out on his small dreams busted larger ones than others, including a nice television, pretty expensive for 1960. The episode was a cautionary tale about want, and nobody got what they desired the most, or even least. If I had interpreted the signs correctly, the next theme is about not trusting your lying eyes. The clues were right in front of us all along. If you notice, many of the characters have something close in front of them. It's more than Hammer staring at himself in a mirror or at a poster in a dead-end alley. It's the mob boss sitting close to his TV set. Keep looking for those clues and you'll see Maggie singing into a rather oversized microphone. I'm sure those older and still alive will say the microphone is typical for the time. But look at it. It's so huge. It's the center of gravity when the camera circles Maggie. If you're still not convinced, Old Man Marshak is introduced staring down into a newspaper. Each and every person who stares close into an object is soon betrayed. Everything they will see is a lie. Now it's time for some alternative theories. First up, the real Andy Marshak was dead. This theory comes with the help of the old worn poster showcasing Andy at the back of the alley. It looks to have been there a while as a remnant of another time. Unlike the obituaries, which were recent, Hammer reaches into the past for a face that would save his life. If Andy had passed away with help of his supposed nefarious lifestyle, it would explain the shock and irrational behavior of his father. The ghost of Andy walked out of the shadows, reminding the old man the pain Andy had caused. In retrospect, Hammer's excuses not knowing nor recognizing his father figure would have enraged the old man as he would see a premonition of past events repeating, perhaps including, let's say, physical misbehaviors. For old man Marshak, Andy is dead. Since he apparently keeps a revolver near his newspaper stand, he was going to make sure Andy stayed dead. The real Andy Marshak isn't somewhere continuing his boxing career, nor is he enjoying a good bottle of beer or listening to jazz. He's been dead. The last clue comes from the title of the episode itself, The Four of Us Are Dying. Foster, Sterig, Hammer, and Marshak. It's a subtle pun that with one curl of a finger, the history of four, not three, came to their conclusion. Finally, the old man wasn't Andy's father, but a delusional, unhinged troll. You heard me right. The old man was a crazy man who looked up and saw a scandalous celebrity and played out a troubling role-playing session. Unable to tell right from wrong or reality from fantasy, the old man adopted Andy as his own son just long enough to get himself headlined in the newspaper. You'll wonder, did I do anything more than headcanon? Where's my evidence? Let's examine if the old man was mentally unstable. Now we got that out of the way, what hints did we have that the crazy geezer and the image of Andy Marshak are unrelated? It's not definitive that Andy's last name was Marshak as his poster strangely had his last name ripped from the walls. Let's acknowledge this fact. Out of anything the old man could have been, he wasn't selling shoes, being a street peddler, or just taking a random stroll. No, he ran a newspaper stand. 
in an episode where the newsprint is a source of persuasive information to the masses. In modern vernacular, the old man was selling and indulging in social media. Ending up stalking a celebrity he followed didn't sneak past me either. What had Andy done that was so despicable anyways? If we listen to the old man, he gives no details, just hyperbole, polemic commentary you would see in social media. Broke your mother's heart before you did dirt to a sweet, decent little girl who would have cut off an arm for you. This is because deep down, he doesn't know and only remembers the same vague clickbait. The biggest clue, however, was the episode told the truth right in front of you. When the old man confronts Hammer as Andy, it was the only scene where Hammer, impersonating another, told the truth when he said he doesn't know or recognize the crazy newspaper vendor. Even the old man said what we thought was in metaphor. But now you ain't my son. Now you ain't nothing to me. We were so sunk into the illusion, we didn't even consider its literal truth. This may also explain the lack of emotion from the old man when Hammer revealed his true face, one that was not Andy. The truth, Hammer was not Andy, was no less shocking than the old man not being his father, because the fantasy was over. You may be asking, why the trouble? Why the deception? when it's much easier just to believe Andy was the old man's son. Because the old man was Hammer's poetic reflection, and he was playing his own game of imposter with Archie Hammer. Like Hammer, the old man had his own newspaper clippings to read, and his lines were long rehearsed. Archie Hammer's abilities reminded me of a villain I first saw in Batman the Animated Series. Clayface. If you read The Twilight Zone Companion, written by Mark Zickrey, you'll learn that the early title of the script was Rubberface. The Four of Us Are Dying was an ambitious episode, needing four similar looking actors to play different faces, but linked to a common personality. The cinematography is eye catching, going for a film noir look, using clever techniques to switch Hammer's appearance without the non-existent 1960s quality CGI. I enjoyed how it used shadows and the impractical floating neon lights. The Four of Us Are Dying gets three dimensions out of five. It does have a couple tropes. Tag them Supernatural Character and Comeuppance. This is Mr. G of Synergy leaving you with these final words. If you want to take another man's spoils, you'll have to pay his debts in the Twilight Zone. Check out other videos on the channel. Thanks for watching.